Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this first talk in J.B. Anderson's new series, The Presidency, Campaigns and Crises. Today's speaker, local historian J.B. Anderson, has long been a very popular speaker at our history talks. Today's talk is uh, entitled Campaign Promises Broken and Unfulfilled. JB's appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with financial support from the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. There we go. Uh, I assume everyone can see this. Um, you know, the week, uh, as the week plays out, uh, there's some topics that we've suggested for the week that will be slightly shorter and some slightly longer. So the day's broken and unfulfilled promises is 78 slides. I can usually do about 130, so we'll probably get into third parties and rise of the secret ballot. Then um, the third week, I've got 159 slides and the fourth week, 200. So we'll actually get into that third week during the uh, second week. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about, broken and unfulfilled promises. And you can see that's uh, about 78 slides. Here's an intro. Uh, broken and unfulfilled promises in the U.S. presidency. The list is too long, so we're going to have to shorten it. We'll do a few over the last uh, hundred years in particular. Let's start with Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he was elected president in 1912 and again in 1916. In 1916, World War II, or uh, World War I, uh, had a couple of years under its belt. And of course, it wasn't known as World War I because there was no World War II yet. Uh, it was called the Great War. And uh, Wilson's campaign slogan for 1916 was that he'd kept us out of that war. Uh, here are buttons from the 1916 campaign. War in Europe, peace in America, God bless Wilson. He kept us out of war and a poster uh, with a quote that um, he kept us out of war. Uh, and this was true in 1916. However, a year later, after he was elected, we got into the war. So that was a broken promise. Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon Johnson would really get close to people, as you can see in this uh, photo here. Uh, and his uh, 1964 campaign promise, we're not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. Uh, by the time... Uh, Johnson was leaving office. There were half a million U.S. soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, it became such an issue that Johnson felt there was no way he could win the 68 election. He chose not to run. He had served a year and uh, about, about a year and two months after the assassination of Kennedy. Then he ran again. So he had, uh, you know, five years and two months in. Uh, 25th Amendment limits anyone from serving more than 10 years as president. So Johnson had uh, five years and two months. Another term would have put him at nine years and two months. So he's under the 10 year limit. Uh, there's also a two year limit uh, or, or a two term limit. So if you're elected to two terms, you can't run again for a couple of years only. Uh, so Johnson chose not to run because of this uh, controversy. Richard Nixon, uh, 1968 campaign, 
he had a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. And he uh, said, well, uh, you know, if I start giving out details and stuff, it's too soon and it will affect negotiations uh, later on, et cetera. So uh, just accept the fact that I've got a secret plan and it will end this war. Uh, as a private citizen now running for president, uh, Nixon was negotiating with the Vietnamese uh, through the woman in the middle here, Anna Chenault. Uh, Claire Chenault was her husband. He was a World War II general, and he was the head of the Flying Tigers, who are a very famous group from World War II. Uh, a private citizen negotiating government matters with a foreign country is guilty of treason. So this was, uh, this was serious, although nothing was done about it. And uh, eventually under Nixon, Henry Kissinger also pictured here would become secretary of state. Uh, took four years for Nixon to withdraw troops. So his promise about having a secret plan and getting us out of the war took quite a while. Uh, his campaign slogan in uh, 1968 was Nixon's the one. Here's a couple of buttons from that uh, campaign, a uh, picture of Richard Nixon declaring him to be the one and just and a button simply saying uh, Nixon's the one. Uh, there was some kickback on this nasty kind of, some of you may think it nasty stuff. Nixon's the one. These were posters that were put out. There was also a cartoon featuring Lucy, the Peanuts character, and buttons were made. Nixon's the one. Uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter made lots of speeches about the energy crisis. Uh, and uh, people uh, generally in the United States and politicians in particular really paid little attention uh, to this uh, need that was being expressed by uh, Carter. Uh, he had solar panels installed on the roof of the White House. Here's uh, in the upper right is a picture of Carter showing uh, members of the press and some other dignitaries the solar panels after they had been installed. And there's a um, aerial view of the White House showing the location of these solar panels. Uh, Reagan took these panels down, saw no need for it. Plus everybody went uh, uh, with solar panels and wind, uh, all his rich pals in the oil industry would be in big trouble. Um, he wanted to increase the gas tax. Uh, since gas is a major pollutant, uh, he felt that increasing the gas tax would bring the use of gasoline down and as a result uh, would improve uh, the environment. Uh, none of it worked. Um, was this Carter's fault? Uh, was it, a, it really wasn't a broken promise, but it was something that he was unable to uh, carry out, get support for. Even to this day, I mean, we're 45 years later, and uh, there's not, uh, there may be interest. A lot of people say there's not a great deal of interest even to this day. Uh, we certainly are behind other countries, uh, Germany in particular. Germany had 16 nuclear power plants. They've installed alternative energy sources like crazy, and they're now down from 16 to nine nuclear power plants. Ronald Reagan. Reagan uh, promised prayer in the schools. Uh, let the kids pray when they come to school. Each class could start with a prayer. Each day could start with a prayer. 
uh, he was notified that uh, constitutional amendment would be needed for such activity. Uh, and it, it never happened. Reagan spoke about this for six years in total, uh, wanting this done. Uh, it did not get done. But George H.W. Bush, read my lips, no new taxes, 1988 uh, campaign promise. And uh, he then signed a bill, raised taxes. Now, you can argue that uh, these weren't new taxes, they were old taxes that were being raised. So his statement, no new taxes, maybe we can say that that really held, although people certainly thought it meant uh, that he wouldn't raise taxes. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton wanted to renovate the health care system in the United States. And actually, uh, when he talked about renovating it, he really meant the creation of a national uh, health care system. He placed his wife, Hillary Clinton, pictured here in charge of uh, getting this, um, this bill through Congress. Uh, it was derisively called Hillary care, just as Obamacare was intended to be a derisive term, but has come to uh, just simply be a descriptive term. Uh, other Repub or other Rep yeah, so Obamacare anyway, uh, did get passed, but isn't anywhere near national health insurance. Uh, Bob Dole pictured here was Senator from Kansas, and he led the fight uh, against the Clinton health care plan uh, for the Republican Party. He was a leader in the Senate. I met him on more than one occasion. I worked at the Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota. And uh, Dole was one of two people, uh, Walter Mondale, the other one, who were in charge of raising funds for the Humphrey Institute. Uh, Humphrey Institute was the School of Public Affairs. It's a graduate school. Uh, you get a master's degree there, et cetera. You have to have a four-year degree to get in. And uh, why in the world would a Republican, Bob Dole, be interested in raising money for the Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota. But the reason is uh, Dole and Humphrey were both from agricultural states and they introduced lots of legislation that they co-sponsored together that uh, would benefit uh, agriculture generally. Uh, but uh, uh, Dole uh, fought this national health care initiative by the Clinton administration. Uh, he's now, I think he's 95 years old. I have a letter ready for his death that I'll send to uh, on newspapers for an editorial comment. Uh, I figure at the time that Dole had, uh, uh, was fighting against uh, the Clinton health care plan that he had four health care plans for himself. He was a Senate employee that gave him health care. His wife was head of the Red Cross. Uh, if she had family coverage, he could have gotten coverage there also. Uh, Dole was a World War II veteran. He'd been wounded in the war, lost use of his right hand. Anytime I shook hands with him, it was left-handed handshake. He always held a pencil in his right hand that he was gripping and he'd play with it between his fingers and trying to keep the muscles active. And at the time he was fighting uh, against Clinton's health care plan, he was over 65, so he was eligible for Medicare. So basically, he was denying lots of people health care when he himself 
uh, could have pocketed four different kinds of coverage. Uh, this is generally a problem with that GI generation. They've done lots of things that benefit themselves, but not others. Uh, socialism for them, tough bananas for everybody else. Uh, if you serve in the military, you've got free health care till your death. Uh, so it's military service to death, health care, uh, guaranteed home loans, free college with a stipend, or, or at least to some extent you get those things, those items. Um, also, the GI generation has blocked its children from seats of power. Uh, as a result, the generation following the GI generation is called the silent generation. Uh, they, uh, over a 60 year period, had never elected one of their cohorts to the US presidency. Uh, they never held a majority of gubernatorial offices in the states, and they never controlled state legislatures. This is the first generation in United States history to be so, uh, whatever, honored. <laughs> uh, so healthcare for all never got accepted. Uh, the promise of uh, national health care by Clinton um, never became a reality. Uh, George W. Bush. Uh, George W. Bush uh, frequently talked about changing the tone in the federal government. Uh, that did not happen. By changing the tone, he meant uh, let's all pat each other on the back, shake hands, and keep talking. And things have actually uh, gotten worse. Uh, he also wanted to privatize Social Security. Uh, the reality of this privatization would be rich pals of the Bush family uh, get to manage a gigantic account, a bunch of money that people have paid in, and uh, they would certainly get a portion of the uh, benefits uh, of that money making interest, et cetera. So the real reason was uh, uh, benefit people who would manage these accounts. He wanted to reduce government spending, Bush said. Reality here is in blue, it shows the increases in government spending during the eight years of the William Clinton administration. Then in red, it shows the percent increases annually during the eight years of the W. Bush administration. And you can see uh, they're almost all uh, higher. Uh, and that eighth year, dramatically higher. So uh, reducing government spending did not happen under George W. Bush. Barack Obama. Uh, where was he born? Uh, this is the birther controversy. It's an interesting uh, topic here, but uh, uh, where was he born and what, what denial was he making? And uh, the critics were saying, show us your birth certificate. And by the way, what religion are you? And uh, will he show any of that information became an issue. Uh, and uh, broken promises, when's this, when's this uh, birth certificate going to come out? Uh, one of the arguments was he was born in Kenya. Uh, the uh, map of Africa and the lower left shows the arrow pointing to the nation of Kenya, which is a West African nation. Obama, by the way, was not born of the slave experience. His father was from Kenya. Uh, so he was uh, born uh, uh, of an African person, not a person who'd gone through the slave experience. So we've had a black president, but we've never had one uh, 
who uh, came out of the slave experience in the United States. Uh, what's his religion? Well, uh, none of this got resolved to the liking of Obama opponents. And it finally got to a point where Obama made some decisions that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it's mostly Republicans wanted to know this, uh, but suddenly they became quiet. Uh, they stopped talking about this birther controversy. Where was he born? Does he have a right to be president? If he was born outside the United States, he can't be president. The man's an illegitimate president. So why did the Republicans go quiet? It's because Ted Cruz wanted to run for the presidency. And we know for a fact, Ted Cruz was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, one Republican did continue with the birther controversy. And that was Donald Trump shown here in a rare photo wearing a mask. Uh, Obama said he wasn't going to give in on this, refused to release his birth certificate, and eventually he did release his birth certificate. You can see his name there on the uh, top line across here, and his birth August 4th, 1961. Hawaii, he was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, on this line on the island of Oahu, but born in Hawaii, and it was after it became a state. 21 August of 59. He was born August 4th of 61. That's a year and 50 weeks after Hawaii had become a state. So he was indeed born in the United States, according to this certificate. Uh, I want to take a look at the history of birtherism. Uh, we're going to talk about Alexander Hamilton, uh, Chester Allen Arthur, who was president of the United States in the 1880s. We're going to talk about the Kennedy clan, uh, all those three guys who were interested in being president. And I'll tell you a story about a woman in my class. And I'm going to tell you about a 1986 law. And then we're going to talk about Goldwater and McCain, Barry Goldwater and John McCain also. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was born in Jamaica. He had all the makings for being a president of the United States. Could he have been president? The answer is yes, he could. What the Constitution says is you have to be a natural born citizen of the United States or a resident citizen at the time of the adoption of this Constitution. Well, Hamilton was born in Jamaica, but he was a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of the Constitution. So he was eligible to be president. Now, for instance, uh, you know, Barack Obama was not born uh, before the Constitution was adopted. Uh, Chester Allen Arthur was born uh, in this county here that borders on Canada. And some people said, well, they actually lived across the border in Canada, uh, his opponents uh, stated this. Uh, the Kennedy clan, uh, the Kennedy spent a lot of time vacationing in Europe. And if Joseph Kennedy's uh, wife was uh, uh, pregnant, he would send her back to Massachusetts to be sure that uh, his children were all born in the US and consequently would be eligible to be president. I have this arrow uh, in, in England because uh, 
Joseph Kennedy <clears throat> became ambassador to England under Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, uh, he didn't have any children after that uh, time or during those 1930s when he was ambassador, but he certainly would have sent his wife back to Massachusetts uh, had he been. Uh, uh, there was a woman in my class, I was talking about all of this and uh, there were people that were going, well, wait a minute, uh, why is this even an issue? I mean, especially if you're born someplace like Ted Cruz, okay, he's born in Canada, but his mother was a U.S. citizen. His father wasn't, so isn't he okay? Uh, no, he isn't. Woman in my class stood up and said, my husband was working for a U.S. corporation and was working in Belgium. We were both U.S. citizens. When we came back to the United States, we had a baby that was born in Belgium. We had to file for citizenship for that baby. She said it went very easy, very short term and neat and simple to do. But the fact was uh, her son was not considered a citizen until they got him registered. So you're born, there's a 1986 law. If you're foreign born, but your parents are US citizens, then you're a citizen. So that 1986 law resolved that issue, but no one was grandfathered in. Ted Cruz was born before 1986. So it doesn't count It only, as a matter of fact, this is just 35 years ago, and you have to be 35 in order to run for president. Uh, Barry Goldwater was born in Arizona in 1909. It wasn't a state until 1912, yet Barry Goldwater received the 1964 nomination of the Republican Party for the presidency. Uh, John McCain was born in the Panama Canal Zone before 1986, even though he was born to two people who were U.S. citizens and uh, ran for the presidency um, in, uh, what was it, 2008? So uh, let's take another look uh, here at Obama. Uh, Obama promises. Now, uh, you know, historian, on recent presidents, uh, historians have kept track of promises. Uh, during Obama's eight years, he made 533 promises and he accomplished 48% of them. That's actually is a pretty good record by comparison. Uh, Donald Trump, broken and unfulfilled promises. Uh, this took a lot of work keeping track of all this stuff. 1,461 days in office, 30,573 lies. Well, are they broken promises? Well, many of them were things he said he was gonna do. That's almost 21 lies per day. Uh, well, how could you lie that frequently? Well, a lot of it was uh, on Twitter. This one's about fish. Uh, three major campaign uh, promises that Donald Trump made. Uh, one was to repeal Obamacare. Uh, the House of Representatives did this about 60 times, but the bill never got through the Senate. So Obamacare never got repealed. Although the House of Representatives was certainly supportive. Renegotiate NAFTA. That's the North American Free Trade Agreement. And it's between Canada, the United States and Mexico. 
and that never happened. It did not uh, go away, did not get renegotiated as such. Uh, build a wall on the Mexican border. Uh, there's a variety of figures about what was spent. Uh, generally, you see the figure about $8 billion, but uh, it put up uh, very few miles of, of a wall, and it's actually not a wall, it's more a fence. Uh, so building the wall on the Mexican border never happened either. So that's a not, not, and a not for Donald Trump. Take a look at campaign promises generally. Uh, two major categories. I'm gonna cut your taxes and I'm gonna create lots of jobs. Uh, and the reality has been uh, a lot of money's been put into individual pockets. Most of the tax cuts that we've seen are for the wealthy. And that sounds good to the working class, but there have either been very small tax cuts or no tax cuts. Uh, most of the tax cuts have actually been corporate in nature. Uh, in these two major categories that every president seems to support. 20th century issues, uh, it's been said, people vote their pocketbooks. So look at the economy and uh, that'll be a good indicator as to who's gonna win an election. Uh, these pocketbooks used to have money in them. They now have plastic in them. So credit cards are a big item. Uh, campaigning is now a marketing process. It costs literally hundreds of millions of dollars, just a presidential campaign. We have had two people running for president and they have spent over a billion dollars between the two of them for a job uh, that doesn't pay $2 million over the course of uh, a four year period. And uh, a lot of what goes on is television advertising, it's marketing. Uh, we show short quips, uh, generally of a positive nature when we're looking at the candidate you're marketing for generally, however, mostly of a negative nature for your candidate's opponent. Uh, so the, the candidate is the product. The campaign's really based on capitalism. It's kind of advertising. Uh, it's economic in nature, uh, tax cuts, et cetera, uh, jobs. You know, it's based on the economy. What happened to the political aspects of the presidency? Well, they've, uh, to some extent, uh, have gone away. So promises are what candidates propose to do. It's really what their job is all about. Uh, one of the famous quotes concerning campaign promises is, Promises are the sweetest lies. Uh, issues in campaigns generally involve money, spending too much. Uh, there's all, no end of sound bites that we hear that center on economics. Uh, I'll be fiscally responsible. I'm going to lower spending. Uh, strong military. We need to pump lots of stuff into the military, green stuff. Uh, and we're gonna cut unemployment to a lower number. Uh, it was Reagan who actually did this. Uh, uh, we, uh, unemployment, uh, if you were unemployed, you were counted as unemployed till you found a job. Reagan said, you know, after six months, people don't get paid any employment benefits anymore. So why should we count them? They're chronically unemployed. They're lazy. 
uh, in six months, they couldn't find a job. So we quit counting people who were unemployed more than six months or whose benefits had run out. Uh, also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, also we were, uh, there were several hundred thousand people every year coming out of the military. Well, it's really not fair to count them as unemployed. They had been counted in the past. Reagan said, no, we can't do that. Uh, many economists today say the unemployment uh, figures that we see like at 4%, they're really double that uh, under the old system. Uh, political parties have platforms with planks. And these are campaign promises generally. Uh, the proposals or promises are called planks and all the planks put together are called the party platform. Uh, generally, they're not widely available. You can find them online. Almost no one downloads them or looks at them. Uh, it's way too lengthy a read. There'll, there'll be 50 pages in length. And many of the issues in there are not economic in nature. Uh, it's a whole lot of things that uh, varying groups within the political party uh, want to emphasize. Uh, this is the most recent Democratic Party platform. Uh, and these are just the 10 hottest items. Uh, immigration reform, LGBTQ rights, voting rights, uh, campaign finance reform, reproductive health rights, health care, gun control, climate uh, difficulties, problems, cleanups, etc. A living wage, minimum wage is what they're talking about there, debt free college. Uh, however, this, uh, as I said, this is a, almost a 50 page uh, uh, long read. Uh, of the Democratic Party platform from recent campaign. Uh, now we're going to move into uh, third parties make a big showing. And uh, there have been many third parties in American history. Let's take a look at uh, some of them. Uh, third parties have won a couple of presidential elections in U.S. history, uh, and lots of other third parties have made big showings. Thank you. Uh, four third parties have received uh, electoral votes. Uh, first was the Republican Party. It was founded in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1854. So it was a third political party. It elected its first president in 1860, Abraham Lincoln, a third party candidate. Uh, there had been the Democratic Party, the Federalist Party, and the Whig Party were the three major parties in the first half of the 1800s. Uh, then the Republican Party was founded and uh, immediately a tremendous number of Whigs migrated into the Republican Party. It really became a major force, but it was a third party. Uh, this is Abraham Lincoln, third, third party candidate. Uh, during the 1860 campaign, there were four parties, Republicans with Lincoln, Southern Democrats. This is John C. Breckinridge. He ran as a Southern Democrat. Uh, Constitutional Union Party. Uh, this is John Bell. He was the candidate for that party in 1860. And the Northern Democrats ran Stephen Douglas. Douglas County here in Minnesota is named for Stephen Douglas. 
uh, the capital of a county, the county seat is Alexandria, of Minnesota. And uh, Douglas is most famous for 1858 debates with Abraham Lincoln for the United States Senate seat in Illinois. Uh, a lot of people think these famous Lincoln-Douglas debates were the 1860 presidential election. They were not. They were two years earlier for uh, the US Senate. Uh, I had a political science professor who said, uh, you know, we talk about the Democrats and the South being democratic. The reality was <clears throat> what you had uh, through, you know, for a hundred years before and after the Civil War were Southern Democrats, and they were separate from Northern Democrats. And then you had a very liberal group of Republicans from 1860 on, uh, and they were known as the Northeast Republicans because they were from those Northeastern states, uh, New Jersey, New York, up to Maine. And uh, then you had Prairie Republicans who were more conservative. However, uh, they're under uh, Teddy Roosevelt, those Prairie Republicans became very liberal. We even call them progressives today. Uh, and then that changed also. But what you had was a union of Northern Democrats and Northeastern Republicans, Southern Democrats and Prairie State Republicans. Uh, here's a look at the vote uh, in the 1860 election. And you can see Lincoln got 1.9 million votes. Breckenridge, the Southern candidate, got 848,000. Bell, Constitutional Union, got 591,000. And Douglas of the Northern Democrats got 1.4 million. Uh, in the electoral vote uh, category, you can see uh, Lincoln got uh, about half, the more than half of the electoral votes, 180. Uh, Douglas, the most famous uh, of the Democratic candidates only got one electoral vote. And then you can see the number of states they carried. Lincoln carried 18. Uh, Breckenridge, Southern Democrat, carried 11, all those Southern states. And Bell and Douglas uh, hardly had a showing uh, during those, uh, that 1860 election. Uh, Lincoln received 39.8% of the popular vote. This is the lowest winning presidential per percentage of the vote in United States history. He received 1.9 million of 4.74 million votes. This makes Lincoln our least popular candidate in terms of percentage of voters who elected him. Uh, let's take a look at 1864. This is another uh, third party year. Republican party uh, didn't think Lincoln was strong enough on anti-slavery. Uh, they really wanted the civil war to be about slavery. Lincoln was saying, no, uh, it's about maintaining the union. And it was these uh, uh, Republican anti-slavery folks in the North that forced Lincoln into the Emancipation Proclamation, <clears throat> which only freed slaves in territories that had not yet been conquered. We'd conquered something like half the South already. So the Emancipation Proclamation did not abolish slavery. It just freed some slaves. Uh, the Republican Party did not nominate Lincoln in 1864 for this reason. Instead, they nominated this man, John C. Fremont, 
who during the uh, campaign of 1864 dropped out of the race, figured he didn't have a chance of winning. Uh, John C. Fremont was a famous uh, explorer. Lincoln created the National Union Party. <clears throat> now see how that sounds like the purpose of the Civil War is to reunite the Union. So maintain the Union. That was Lincoln's uh, big theme. Uh, George McClellan pictured here was a Civil War uh, general who'd been fired by Lincoln because he, Lincoln said, you refuse to fight. Uh, and McClellan kept saying, oh, I need another 100,000 men. Oh, we need more armaments. Uh, uh, so uh, finally, Lincoln said, get out. And he loved Ulysses Grant, who was a very strong uh, fighter during the Civil War as a general. Uh, so the uh, Democratic Party chose McClellan to be their candidate uh, during the 1864 election. And here's the results, and Lincoln won big this year, but as a third party candidate. Uh, and McClellan uh, came the closest of the candidates uh, to Lincoln. 2.2 uh, million to 1.8 million in the popular vote category. Electoral college was a sweep 212 to 21. States carried 22 versus three. This was a giant uh, victory uh, for Lincoln. And Lincoln was then, it became the only president elected from two third parties. Uh, third parties make a big showing, 1912. Uh, 1909, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who'd been president for almost eight years, soon after entering office, uh, William McKinley was assassinated. His vice president was uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So Roosevelt became president. He served almost... Uh, you know, four years of the uh, McKinley uh, presidency and then was elected in his own right in 1904 and served another uh, four years till 1909. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt really liked uh, William Howard Taft. They were pals uh, and uh, as a result, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, uh, I want William Howard Taft to be the nominee of the Republican Party in 1908. And he was, and he won the election. However, after four years of Taft policies, and after Teddy Roosevelt seeing that these Taft policies were not what he had in mind, uh, he said, Taft, you're not, you're not going after big business like you should be. Uh, that's what I expected from you. So he said, okay, I'm coming back. It's 1912. Taft wants a second term. I want a third one, uh, said Teddy Roosevelt. So both men uh, tried for the Republican nomination in 1912. Uh, and uh, it didn't work out well for Roosevelt. Uh, we'll show you some results later, uh, and they'll be surprising. Uh, so uh, Teddy Roosevelt started a third party known as the Progressive Party, and it was nicknamed the Bull Moose Party because of the, just the way Teddy Roosevelt handled himself. He was ferocious in his speaking style. And here are some uh, buttons from, uh, and a poster uh, from that 1912 election and that progressive party uh, of Teddy Roosevelt's. Uh, Republicans were split. Uh, Taft was running, Teddy Roosevelt was running. 
Consequently, a Democrat was elected. This was only the second time in 42 years that a Democrat had been elected to the presidency. And it was because the Republican Party had been uh, split in this 1912 election. Actually, from 1860 to 1932, a period of 72 years, there were only two Democratic presidents, Grover Cleveland, who served eight years, and Woodrow Wilson, who served eight years. In 72 years, there was a Democrat in the presidency for 16 of those years, or just a hair more than uh, 20%. Candidates in this day and age were selected by party bosses. Uh, there were those in the party that really controlled what went on. They controlled the conventions. Uh, they presented a candidate usually to the convention. There were people in the, at the conventions that wanted to nominate somebody from their state, a favorite son. They wanted to nominate somebody they thought had a chance and against the party bosses, etc. However, in 1912, they did start doing primaries, but these primaries counted for nothing. So, I mean, party bosses were deciding. So there were campaigns, state to state. Uh, this was a progressive party, Bull Moose Party idea, and the other political parties went along with it. Uh, so this is the first time it was, uh, was used. Uh, party officials were not about to lose any of the power they had. So they said, well, the primaries don't count. You know, let's just have fun with them. But we get to decide at the convention. Today, uh, primaries are the deciding factor in who gets the <clears throat> nomination of a political party. Um, as a kid, I would listen to these political party conventions and it was uncertain who the candidate for might be. Who's this party gonna nominate? Will it be uh, Harold Stassen in 1952? Will it be Dwight David Eisenhower or will it be Robert Taft? And they all went in there with uh, big numbers and Eisenhower won. Uh, today, we know who the nominee is going to be before the convention starts because somebody has won uh, the primaries. Uh, Republicans who ran in 1912 in the primaries include Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Robert La Follette, who was a senator from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, there were 13 states that did primaries. Teddy Roosevelt won eight of them. Taft won three. And La Follette won two. So Taft gets the nomination. Ha <laughs> ha. Political party bosses are in control. Um, here are the uh, vote totals. Uh, 1.2 million for Teddy Roosevelt, 800,000 for William Howard Taft, and Robert La Follette got 300,000. So Taft, with two thirds the popular vote of Teddy Roosevelt, gets the nomination. Uh, the issues in the campaign and the issues that brought uh, Teddy Roosevelt back to uh, campaigning and eventually creating this third party, the Progressive Party, was uh, Taft wanted the courts to decide about things that corporations were doing that were questionable. So the courts will decide these corporate lawsuits according to Taft. Uh, this means that there's, there's thousands of lawsuits uh, corporations file bankruptcy in order to avoid these lawsuits. This is still true today. Uh, probably the biggest case of recent years has been Johns Mansville and asbestos. 
they put asbestos in a lot of buildings. They made the material and they got sued. So they said, uh, okay, we're filing bankruptcy. And the next day they open up under a new name, just Mansville. And so that company doesn't exist anymore. And you can't sue them. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, if you have regulations in place, then people are protected up front. Businesses can't do what they're doing, and then you have to sue them. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a regulations guy. Taft was a let the courts decide guy. Campaign issues uh, continued. Courts decide uh, this was a big issue for uh, George W. Bush 100 years later. Uh, there was lots of talk about uh, increasing regulations and why have certain regu why are regulations not being enforced now and so on. And W. Bush said, uh, let the courts decide this. This isn't, uh, the federal government doesn't need to be regulating these folks. Today, these uh, same people that uh, want the courts to decide argue that the courts are overcrowded and lawsuits are frivolous. So campaign issues in 1912, courts decide thousand, that means thousands of lawsuits, corporations filing bankruptcy to avoid them. Regulations means people are protected up front. Courts decide was W. Bush position a hundred years after uh, Taft and Teddy Roosevelt were arguing about it, and then uh, overcrowded courts and frivolous lawsuits. So the 1912 election involves Woodrow Wilson, a college professor and a president of a college, an academic person, had a PhD uh, wrote in political science, wrote his PhD thesis on uh, parliamentary government. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, pictured in the middle, a uh, child of wealth uh, who went into politics, and, and William Howard Taft, who uh, was uh, uh, grew up through the ranks in the Republican Party, and his son, of course, Robert Taft, became very famous and almost got the Republican nomination for the presidency in the 1952 election. Another third party was involved in 1912, the Socialist Party. This is in addition to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Progressive Party. Their nominee was Eugene Debs, pictured here. He received 6% of the vote. This is, a, this is a very large turnout of the vote for a third party. Uh, today, we have matching funds from the federal government. So if you raise $100 million, uh, the federal government will match that money as long as you get 5% of the vote. Debs got 6% in 1912. Had this matching funds law been in effect, he would have received matching uh, federal funds for the donations he received. By the way, this matching funds bill was a Hubert Humphrey uh, that enter, it was Hubert Humphrey, the Minnesota senator, that introduced that bill and got it passed in the House, and in particular in the Senate. And uh, uh, Humphrey was adamant about the 5%. He said, we don't want every little guy that wants to run for president to get matching federal funds. They need to make a decent showing and 5% was the figure. 1912 election results, Wilson got 6.3 million popular votes. 
Roosevelt, 4.1, Taft, 3.5, and Debs, 900,000. Uh, Roosevelt and Taft got 7.6 million votes. That's more than Wilson got. The only reason Wilson got elected president here was uh, as a result of the Republican Party being split. In the Electoral College, a massive 435 electoral votes for Wilson compared to 88 for Roosevelt and eight for Taft. Uh, states carried 40, uh, six and two and zero for Debs. Uh, there's just another listing of the vote totals, electoral and popular votes and some pictures of the guys. Uh, third parties make a big showing. Again, 1948, uh, there were four major candidates in the 1948 election and uh, two of them were from third parties. Uh, Hubert Humphrey made a speech at the Democratic Convention in 1948 on civil rights. It's time for the Democratic Party to come out of the dark shadows and into the full sunlight of civil rights. Uh, well, this really angered uh, the South and the South was Democrats. They were at the Democratic Convention. They got up and walked out of the Democratic Convention uh, when Humphrey made this speech on civil rights and what the future of the Democratic Party should be about. Uh, the gentleman on the left there with his hand uh, under his coat is Strom Thurmond. So the Southern states formed a third party. It was called the States Rights Party, but its nickname was the Dixiecrats. And uh, there's a button, States Rights Democrat, and Thurman and Wright were the two people running for president and vice president. So Strom Thurman, and you can see the button at the bottom, states rights, the constitution. And uh, they were emphasizing state, we get to do in our state what we wanna do, federal government should stay out of it. Here's a picture of Strom Thurman doing push-ups in his office. These are wide armed push ups. Uh, Rody Boschwitz is still alive. He's 90 years old. He served two terms in the US Senate from Minnesota. During those two terms, he had the closest voting record to Strom Thurmond of any other senator. Uh, the other party, the other third party, the fourth party in this 1948 election was the Progressive Party. This is known as the third Progressive Party. 1912, you had Teddy Roosevelt's Progressive Party. 1924, uh, you had the uh, Progressive Party of the Wisconsin Senator, uh, Robert La Follette. And now in 1948, the Progressive Party of Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was a vice president of the United States under Franklin Roosevelt from 1941 to 45. The assumption was he would be renominated uh, to run in 1944 with FDR, uh, but he was not renominated. Lots of people in the Democratic Party said, He's way too liberal. And he had spent a couple of months in Russia uh, talking to Russians and looking at their system and then came back to the US. So there were charges of uh, being a commie as a result. And uh, Harry Truman ended up getting the nomination for vice president under FDR in the 44 election. And then FDR died uh, just uh, 
you know, three or four months after taking office, uh, uh, Wallace would have been president, but instead uh, Truman was. So Wallace thought, well, okay, I got cheated. So he created this third progressive party and ran in 1948. Uh, he is uh, very famous uh, for, uh, it was from Iowa, so he was big into agriculture and farming. And uh, a newspaper that uh, literally uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, farmers uh, subscribed to was Wallace's Farmer. And here's a picture of the top fourth of one of these uh, newspapers. And uh, you subscribe to the newspaper, you get a patch, like you see here on the right side middle, Wallace's Farmer, a farm progress publication. Uh, and so Wallace's, uh, Henry Wallace's family was the Wallace's of this famous uh, newspaper for farmers. Uh, he was born in Iowa, owned a farm in Johnstone, Iowa, pictured here at the Red Star. It's about five miles north of Des Moines. Uh, he started the uh, Hybrid Corn Company, uh, or his family did. And they were among the first people to hybridize corn. So they were genetic corn hybridizers. Uh, they took on the name Pioneer Seed Company, Hybrid Corn Company. Here's the signage for their Toledo, Ohio plant. Uh, so they became Pioneer Seed Company. Still in existence today. Uh, Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa was started by this company and is a major contributor to it. Uh, their slogan, where data meets dirt. Uh, the 1948 uh, campaign saw Truman getting 24.2 million votes. Popular votes, Dewey got 23 million, Thurman 1.8 million, and Wallace 1.6 million. You can see the electoral votes and the number of states carried there. One of the great controversies of this uh, 1948 election as well, the polls were wrong. This proves polling is never right. And uh, that actually is not true. Uh, the last poll taken was two weeks before the election. Well, during that two week period, Truman surged and beat Thomas Dewey, the Republican nominee. And that's when pollsters said, okay, we need to take polls even right up to the day before the election. <clears throat> now there's been some mistakes made in polling recently. And I don't know, I wouldn't call them mistakes, but, uh, some of them are there, they were within the margin of error. And it was a fluky thing, like especially Clinton versus uh, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, Trump won three states by 70 some thousand votes. Uh, so that, uh, that was difficult to predict at that level. Uh, Third parties make a big showing, 1968. Uh, let's see. Uh, modern civil rights movement had started. It was in full swing. And, uh, and here, here you see a march for uh, civil rights. This is uh, Walter Ruther, head of the United Auto Workers. And uh, uh, most of what you see in here is black bay. This is uh, uh, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. I set up a museum at the university for Roy Wilkins. 
he had already died, but I spent a good bit of time with his wife. Um, during this 1968 campaign, it was the civil rights movement in the South and all over the country. Uh, this gave the South intestinal cramps. There were three candidates, one of them a third party. Richard Nixon, the Republican, Hubert Humphrey, the Democrat, and George Wallace in the American Independent Party. Wallace had uh, support in the South. His quote, segregation yesterday, segregation today, segregation forever. Uh, white room, whites only, waiting room. We want white tenants in our white community. Uh, I had uh, gone to the University of Minnesota and graduated and then I went to Mankato State. I was there 64 to 66. Then I went to seminary in Kansas City for three years. And when I arrived there in 1966, there were separate water fountains. I'd never seen anything like it. I thought, well, I'm gonna drive down near the black neighborhood. So I did that. Uh, as soon as you turned into the black neighborhood, none of the streets were paved. Streets were paved all over Kansas City, except in the black neighborhood. There was a bridge into North Kansas City. There were white men standing at that bridge. Who are you? Where are you going? They'd stop all the black people. No, we don't want you shopping here. We don't want you driving through this community. Turn around and head back. Then uh, I got a job at Park College, which is a suburb of Kansas City, Park, uh, Parkville, uh, Missouri. And uh, it still had a small town kind of status, you know, even though it had become, it was a small town that got surrounded by the city. And uh, the college had started accepting black students and they didn't know where they could get haircuts. And uh, some people from Park College went into town and talked to the barbers there and would you cut black hair? Can we send black students here, et cetera? And most of them said, sure, we'll try it. Uh, Richard Nixon's campaign was based on law and order. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Judy, you can hear me? Yeah, I was going to just uh, speak up, JB. We've got uh, a number of questions, and we've only got 15 minutes left. Do you want to? Uh, uh, let's stop here. I'll go back and review this uh, next week. I think that's a good idea. Why don't we launch right into the questions, see if we can get through them uh, before 2.30. Okay, uh, first question, with regards to Nixon negotiating with a foreign country as a private citizen, I think this questioner is referring to um, uh, Claire Chenault's widow. Uh, you said there wasn't anything done. Why is this? Is there something that could have been done but just didn't happen? Anna well, Chenault, I think, is the, the oh, source sure. of this question. Well, it was illegal. You know, I, I mean, it came out later that she was working with Nixon and negotiating with the North Vietnamese. And what she was negotiating was don't resolve this war until after the election, because that'll hurt Nixon. See? Um, and uh, and uh, there is a law against private citizens uh, uh, negotiating with foreign countries over governmental issues. It's, that's a function of the executive branch of the US government. Okay, uh, next question. Is Biden part of the silent generation? Uh, yeah, uh, he's uh, 78 years old, he's borderline. 1943 is the dividing line. And uh, I think that's the year that Biden was born. But for 60 years, nobody from that uh, generation controlled 
anything in politics. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is an oddity. It's also, this is the oldest president ever elected also. Um, so yes, uh, however, people will tell you <clears throat> that when you're that close to the borderline date between generations, a person can often be part of the previous uh, group. So yeah, that's... Uh, okay. He's the first and perhaps last silent generation president. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Why did Obama refuse to release his birth certificate? The delay just made it a bigger deal. Yeah, he didn't want to make it an issue. He thought it was foolishness. And, uh, I, I think he was being advised not to. And I don't know, you know, at the same time, and, and I don't know, I've never heard anybody say this, but at the same time, if you can keep the uh, opposition concentrating on that, you can continue to make them look foolish. Okay, and then uh, another uh, questioner says, I don't understand how the birth er birther issue is a broken promise for Obama. Why did you uh, refer to that as a broken promise or why did you put it in a lecture on broken promises? Yeah, I, well, uh, um, his refusal to deal with it for quite an extended period, but, uh, and the fact that uh, the fact that it became an issue to his opponents, and then they kept quiet about it, that that's a major part of the broken promise aspect of it. You know, we only want presidents born in the United States. Oh well, we'll shut up now. One of our guys is. So the deception perhaps was as much on the Republican side. Yes. Is that what you mean? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, this questioner asks about the town of Breckenridge, Minnesota. Is it named after the Southern Democratic candidate in 1860? Oh, I don't know. I, we can... Uh, Maybe that's something to check on. Yeah, I can, uh, I can look it up. Let me get a sheet of paper here. And, uh, That's okay. I, I will. I will yeah. email you about it. Okay. Sure. Um, so let's go on. Uh, let's see. I, I'm not sure. I think this question. Perhaps you misspelled Barack Obama's name on one of your slides. This questioner says, "Why Barack ending in H instead of Barack ending in K?" Obama. Mm. Or did you deliberately uh, spell his name Barack? Uh, I mean, ending in H. Uh, no, and looking at my keyboard, the uh, H and K are two, two, uh, they're two keys apart. So I can't say, well, I had a fat finger <laughs> on that, but uh, I'll go back and check it and make sure I okay. spell it. Yeah, I'll change it so it's spelled correctly. Okay, I didn't notice it while you were doing it, but all right. Um, notwithstanding the voluminous Democratic platform and the fact that it is not paid much heed, there was some discussion about the fact that the Republicans had no platform in the last election. It was frequently mentioned that the platform was whatever uh, number 45 wanted to do, uh, Trump wanted to do, which was a moving target. Do you think party platforms will quietly disappear? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of doubt it. They've got such a history mm -hmm. and it's still a golden opportunity for a candidate uh, when he's speaking to a group of people as opposed to in a TV ad, a question comes up, he can say, well, look at our platform. We support that. You know, that's, uh, mm -hmm. so there's, there's something where you can say, I've got the force of the party behind me on this and, and so on. Uh, I think the, the lack of a platform that would be drawn up by 
a large group of people kind of flies in the face of somebody who wants to be individually strong, which certainly was the case with uh, Donald Trump. Okay. Um, what percentage of the popular vote did Lincoln receive in 1860? That was 39 point something, 39.8% maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, smallest popular vote total or percentage in US history. Yeah. And the next question uh, asks about the relationship between the Electoral College and third parties. Question is, does the Electoral College pretty much ensure that no third party can survive in the long run? Well, uh, hmm. Yeah, to, uh, I mean, uh, they can ensure, I'm not sure if they can ensure a lack of survival, but they can certainly ensure that um, you're not going to win any state and get an electoral vote. However, uh, there's third parties have survived uh, pretty long periods of time. Uh, the... Um, uh, the big thing that destroys third parties is the two major parties taking up their uh, agendas. So, for instance, you had the Populist Party, which lasted for about, I think, about 35 years, and it was made up mostly of farmers, and uh, they wanted the direct election of U.S. senators. U.S. Senators until 1914 were elected by state legislatures. They were not elected by popular vote. Then in 1914, a third of the states got to elect their senators. 1916, another third. 1918, another third. And uh, uh, I... I uh, that was a proposal of the Populist Party and the two main parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, said, okay, let's do that. And it required a constitutional amendment. And uh, that's generally, uh, that's what kills third parties, is their policies moving, becoming mainstream. I see, yeah. Okay, the next questioner would like you to clarify uh, what you said about Senator Ted Cruz. Are we to understand that Ted Cruz is not eligible to run for president in 2024 or not? It will probably involve a Supreme Court decision. And most of the analysts say the Supreme Court will say, no, he can run, even though he was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Because uh, uh, what does natural born citizen mean? And uh, they think that they'll probably, uh, the, the Supreme Court will have a pretty open view of what that means. Mm -hmm. um, my view is he's ineligible. Uh, natural born citizen meant you were born in the United States. Otherwise, people in the Constitution who were not born in the United States but made eligible for the presidency uh, in our Constitution, if they were citizens at the time of its adoption, that would indicate that foreign born people are not eligible to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and the next question is pushing back a bit, and I must say I kind of join him on this. Uh, he says, why is NAFTA a broken promise for Trump? Uh, wasn't this agreement renegotiated? And, and I believe it was too. What about the USMCA, I think it is, that was uh, negotiated last summer? I think it was summer of 2020. What was it again? No, MC. Uh, USMCA, I believe, was the, the renegotiated NAFTA treaty. Oh, oh. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Clinton uh, actually 
couple of Republican presidents supported it, but it became law under uh, um, Clinton. But then, uh, you know, there uh, what uh, the reason I include it like this is because my assumption is Trump wanted it eliminated, not renegotiated. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And this is a comment. Um, and again, I, I kind of noticed this too. This person says it was interesting to notice how many candidates got in the past got many votes, but very few electoral college votes. And I noticed that as well. Did you want to comment on that? Well, you have to win the state. Whoever wins in the state gets mm -hmm. all that state's electoral votes. So even if you get 6% uh, of the vote nationally, as Eugene Debs did in 1916, um, doesn't mean you've won any state. Uh, the other candidates got more votes in the state than you did. And uh, that's what, that's how it works. You know, that's uh, yeah. until we're, until we're rid of the electoral college um, and there's several movements to rid us of that uh, one is um, uh, there are there are several states that have passed the legislation at the state level that whoever gets the most popular votes nationally we will cast our electoral votes for that person even though they may have lost in our state We'll see what might become of that. Uh, and that may be the way the electoral college gets destroyed. Uh, constitutional amendment is mm -hmm. not, doesn't seem to be going any place. Okay, it looks like we have just time for maybe one or two more questions at most. And so I would like to apologize for those whose questions I'm not getting to, including one person who asked, what about John Anderson in 1980? And I think that's where you better begin next week. I think you just didn't get time to him. Um, I'll ask one last question if we have time for it. Um, what would have happened? Henry Wallace got the fewest votes in the 1948 election, fewest uh, electoral votes. What would have happened if he had not been dropped from the ticket in 1944 uh, Roosevelt would have died, and then Henry Wallace, who maybe was the most left-wing person in the 20th century to get close to the presidency, what would have happened if, had he become president? Yeah, I don't know. I, we really don't know, but I think there would have been a, you know, th this was the beginning of the rise of the anti-communist uh, McCarthy era. I, I think there would have been endless charges against him, especially because of his two month long trip to Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, at the end of World War II like that, you know, we were looking upon Russia as our enemy. Uh, George Patton was calling for an invasion of Russia. We got all the troops right here. Let's just keep going. and. Uh, so militarily, politically, uh, there was just a tremendous anti-Russia movement, and you're a communist if you agree with them, you know. So it, I think it would have been trouble. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to stop there. We've reached the end of our time. I want to thank uh, Speaker J.B. Anderson and our tech crew. And I wanna thank the audience who came up with so many good questions. Uh, we'll see you next week. And JB, I hope you start next week with Anderson <laughs> for president yeah, in 1980, <laughs> another third party. But for today, I'm gonna to say goodbye now. Good, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.